The Indian origin and descent may also be in some measure discerned by their taste for and kind of ornaments. The Israelites were fond of wearing beads and other ornaments, even as early as the patriarchal age, and the taste increased to such a degree that it became criminal and was sharply reprehended by the prophets, particularly Isaiah. The Israelitish women wore rich garters about their legs, and against the rules of modesty they shortened their undergarments in order to show how their legs and feet were decorated. The Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, which loaded them so heavy that they could scarcely walk, and the chains and the bracelets, the ornaments of the legs, and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels. In resemblance to these customs, the Indian females continually wear a beaded string round their legs, made of buffalo hair, which is a species of coarse wool, and they reckon it a great ornament, as well as a preservative against miscarriages, hard labor, and other evils. They wear also a heap of land tortoise shells with pebbles or beads in them, fastened to pieces of deer skins, which they tie to the outside of their legs when they mix with the men in their religious dances. The Indian nations agreed in the custom of thus adorning themselves with beads of various sizes and colors, sometimes wrought in garters, sashes, necklaces, and in strings around their wrists, and so from the crown of their heads sometimes to the cartilage of the nose. And they do on them so much as to make them their current money in all payments to this day. Before we supplied them with our European beads, they had great quantities of wampum, made out of conch shell, by rubbing them on hard stones, and so they formed them according to their liking. With these they bought and sold at a stated current rate, without the least variation for circumstances, either of time or place, and now they will hear nothing patiently of loss or gain, or allow us to heighten the price of our goods, be our reasons ever so strong, or though the difficulties and changes of time may require it. Formerly four deer skins were the price of a large conch shell bead, about the length and thickness of a man's forefinger, which they fixed to the crown of their head as a high ornament, so greatly they valued them. Their beads bear a very near resemblance to ivory, which was highly esteemed by the Hebrews. The New England writers assure us that the Narragansett Indians paid to the colony of Massachusetts 200 fathoms of wampum only in part of a debt, and at another payment, 100 fathoms, which shows the Indian custom of wearing beads, has prevailed far north on this continent and before the first settling of our colonies. According to the Oriental custom, they wear earrings and finger rings in abundance. Tradition says they followed the like custom before they became acquainted with the English. The men and women in old times used such coarse diamonds as their own hilly country produced, when each had a bit of stone fastened with a deer's sinew to the tying of their hair, their nose, ears, and moccasins. But from the time we supplied them with our European ornaments, they have used brass and silver earrings and finger rings. The young warriors now frequently fasten bell buttons or pieces of tinkling brass to their moccasins and to the outside of their boots, instead of the old turkey cockspurs which they formerly used. Both sexes esteem the above things as very great ornaments of dress, and commonly load the parts with each fort, in proportion to their ability to purchase them. It is a common trading rule with us to judge the value of an Indian's effects by the weight of his fingers, wrists, ears, the crown of his head, boots, and moccasins, by the quantity of red paint daubed on his face, and by the shirt about the collar, shoulders, and back, should he have one, of Although the same things are commonly used or disused by males and females, they distinguish their sexes in as exact a manner as any civilized nation. The women bore small holes in the lobe of their ears for their rings, but the young heroes cut a hole around almost the extremity of both their ears, which till healed they stretch out with a large tuft of buffalo's wool mixed with bear's oil. Then they twist as much small wire round as will keep them extended in that hideous form. This custom, however, is wearing off apace. 
They formerly wore nose rings, or jewels, both in the northern and southern regions of America, according to a similar custom of the Jews and Eastern, and in some places they still observe it. At present, they hang a piece of battered silver or pewter, or a large bead to the nostril, like the European method of treating swine, to prevent them from rooting the earth. This, as well as the rest of their customs, is a true picture and good copy of their supposed early progenitors. I have been among the Indians at a drinking match, when several of their bows have been humbled as low as death, for the great loss of their big ears. Being so widely extended, it is as easy for a person to take hold of and pull them off as to remove a couple of small hoops where they hung within reach. But if the ear after the pull sticks to their head by one end, when they get sober, they pair and sew it together with a needle and deer's sinews after sweating him in a stove. Thus the disconsolate warrior recovers his former cheerfulness and hath a lasting caution of not putting his ears a second time in danger with bad company. However, it is not deemed a scandal to lose their ears by any accident, because they became slender and brittle by their virtuous compliance with that favorite custom of their ancestors.